Good evening friends. Welcome back again to another video of Learn by Chemistry. Today's video is going to be very interesting one. During last week video when we discuss about nucleus we shortly introduce the term progeria. We learned that progeria is a defect in nuclear membrane. But since that video was meant for undergraduate students we have not gone in much detail. That's what we are going to do in today's video. By the way, if you have not watched those videos, the link of those videos will be in the description box. So if you want, you can check them out. In today's video, we are going to discuss progeria under the following headings. So without further wasting any time, Let's start the video. Before we start talking about progeria, let me introduce to you another term, progeroid syndrome. Progeroid syndrome involves a group of disorders that runs in family. These disorders share common clinical features of early aging and reduced life expectancy. So progeroid syndrome is a general term used for diseases of early aging and progeria that we are going to discuss in our today's lecture is a type of progeroid syndrome. Now what does the word accelerated aging means? Accelerated aging essentially means the children affected by progeroid syndrome have features that are usually found in old age. So children affected by these diseases looks like their grandfather. Also the diseases that are prevalent in old age are found in these children. In the next slide let us discuss some important progeroid syndromes. The first important progeroid syndrome is Weidman syndrome. The Weidman syndrome is also known as neonatal progeroid syndrome. This disease starts in home, that is, the child is affected in its fetal stage. So, when it is born, it is already affected by the disease. The second Important progeroid syndrome is Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome, in short HGPS. Now HGPS childs are normal at birth. Basically they are apparently normal. Then disease starts appearing by the age of 2 years and gradually all the features evolved and they finally die in their the third disease is Warner syndrome. Warner syndrome is also referred to as adult progeria. The age of onset is usually in their teen. Thus we can see that all these diseases differ in their age of onset. Now let us focus on Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome. If not meant otherwise, progeroid syndrome usually referred to Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome. It is a rare form of genetic disease that runs in family. The mode of inheritance is usually autosomal dominant. The children affected by this disease appear normal at birth. By the age of one year, features such as growth retardation, hair loss starts appearing. In the meantime, other features also start developing and by the age of 13, most of these children die either from cardiovascular event or stroke. So what are the clinical features of HGPS? Let's look into it in the next slide. The clinical features of HGPS are essentially those of early aging and reduced life expectancy. So what are these features of early aging? These children usually have a large size head. As you can see from the picture, there is prominent skull veins hair loss, loss of eyelashes, bulging of eyes, there is pinching of nose, wrinkling of skin, delayed tooth formation, 
high pitched voices all these are present in the children diseases that are normally found in old age are also found in these children such as atherosclerosis insulin resistance leading to diabetes mellitus osteoarthritis stroke all of these are common in these children and the eventual cause of death is usually stroke or heart attack so all these are features of hgps child now let us discuss the genetic basis of hgps hgps is considered to be a laminopathy that means it has a defect in a structure known as nuclear lamina so what is nuclear lamina and what it is made up of let's look into it in the next slide so nuclear lamina is a structure present inside nucleus we have already discussed the structure of nucleus in a previous video nucleus is surrounded by a structure known as nuclear envelope which is a double membrane structure it has a outer membrane and an inner membrane the outer membrane is continuous with rough endoplasmic reticulum as you can see in this picture so this is rough endoplasmic reticulum an inner membrane is known as perinuclear membrane the in between space is known as perinuclear space now just adjacent to the inner membrane is a mesh like structure present this structure is known as nuclear lamina what is its function nuclear lamina gives nucleus structural support and helps to maintain shape most of you have played football inside football there is a structure known as bladder which is usually inflated with air when it is full of air the bladder helps to maintain the shape of football but if it is punctured or its air gets leaked because of some reason the football loses its shape the nuclear lamina's function is similar to bladder's function so it helps to maintain shape of the nucleus one important thing is that the nuclear lamina structure is present underneath the perinuclear membrane it should be adjacent but not adherent or should not stick to the inner nuclear membrane now what it is made up of nuclear lamina is a cytoskeleton structure so it is made up of intermediate filaments and some associated proteins to be specific the intermediate filaments are i5 intermediate filaments and this include lamin a lamin b1 and b2 and c and there are some lamin associated protein which also take part in formation of nuclear lamina in hgps a component of nuclear lamina that is lamin a is most affected so in the next few slide we will first see how lamin a is formed in a healthy individual and then we'll compare hgps against the normal to understand where it goes wrong now let us see how lamin a is normally formed the lamin a gene is first transcribed into mrna which is then translated into lamin a but this passes through an intermediate stage known as pre lamin a which can be thought of as a precursor form of lamin a the pre lamin a is converted into lamin a by several stages of processing some of these processing events takes place in cytoplasm and some in the nucleus in the next slide we will discuss these processing steps so in healthy individuals the pre lamin a which is a protein has a n terminal end and a c terminal end this c terminal end has a short stretches of four amino acid known as cax box here c stands for cysteine a for aliphatic amino acid and x can be any amino acid in the first enzymatic step a farnesyl transferase attaches a farnesyl group to the cysteine residue at the c terminal 
Once the farnesyl group is attached, the farnesylated cysteine is recognized by an endopeptidase, which cleaves the peptide bond just after the cysteine and removes the AAX sequence. Now, the cysteine at the C-terminal is farnesylated. In the next step, a methyl transferase recognizes this farnesylated cysteine and attaches a methyl group to the cysteine residue. Up to this, the events occur in cytoplasm. So, farnesyl transferase step, endopeptidase step, methyl transferase step all takes place in cytoplasm. After this, the farnesylated and methylated p lamine A is translocated to the nucleus via the nuclear pore complex. Inside the nucleus, this form of p lamine A attaches itself to the inner nuclear membrane and farnesyl group acts as lipid anchor. Then, a fourth enzyme known as zinc metallopeptidase cleaves and 15 amino acids from the C-terminal end. This includes the farnesyl and methylated cysteine present at the C-terminal end. The end product after this zinc metallopeptidase step is known as lamin A. After this endopeptidic cleavage, lamin A becomes separated from the inner nuclear membrane because the farnesyl group which acts as the lipid anchor is removed. Now, lamin A functions from inside the nucleus. Now, let's see what happens in HGPS. HGPS, as we know, is caused by a point mutation in lamin A gene. This results in a single base substitution. The effect of mutation has been shown in this picture by a star sign. This is the site of mutation. However, the mutation has no impact during the first three steps of enzymatic processing, but it can be seen during the last step of enzymatic processing, which is catalyzed by zinc metallopeptidase because the effect of point mutation impacts the site of cleavage by zinc metallopeptidase. As a result, the zinc metallopeptidase is not able to cleave the last 15 amino acid sequence from the C-terminal end. So, lamin A is not formed, but a precursor form of pre-lamin A, which is methylated and farnesylated, accumulates inside nucleus. Because the farnesyl group is not removed, this is the farnesyl group, because it is not removed, the pre-lamin A remains anchored to the inner nuclear membrane. And this leads to distorted nucleus. So, this is the genetic basis of Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome. Let us now summarize what we have learned so far. So, there is a point mutation in the lamin A gene, which is the starting event, which alters the cleavage site of zinc metallopeptidase. As a result, a farnesylated form of p lamin A accumulates and this form is also known as progerin protein. This progerin remains anchored to the nucleus and lead, this leads to misshaped and distorted nucleus and this distortion of nucleus by some mechanism leads to premature aging of progeria. The mechanism by which these two events are connected are not known yet and the mechanisms are only speculative but we know few things about the mechanisms. It may involve some form of defective cell division. It may affect the DNA repair mechanism as well as a mechanism involving defect in fibroblast cell polarity has also been postulated. This is a picture showing the nucleus of HGPS where there is a surface blabbing of nuclear membrane 
and this is the normal nucleus. Let us talk about prognosis of HGPS. Being a genetic disease, you can assume that the prognosis of HGPS has to be poor. There is no curative treatment available and most of the child die in their teenage. Life expectancy is mostly 13 years. Some of them may live longer but some die even earlier than 13 years. The cause of death is usually from a coronary vascular event or a cerebrovascular event because these patients often have accelerated atherosclerosis. In the next slide, let us look at the available treatment options. The treatment for HGPS are mostly palliative in nature. Physiotherapy helps in a great deal because it helps to loosen the joint stiffness. Other drugs that are commonly used are nitroglycerin, statin and jolendronate. But there are some important new drugs that are emerging. And these drugs are based on the genetic knowledge about its origin. From our previous discussions, we learned that the farnesyl groups act as lipid anchor which attach the progerin protein to the inner nuclear membrane. These attachments ultimately distort the nucleus shape and results in symptoms of premature aging. So this is inner nuclear membrane and these are the farnesyl anchor attaching the p-lamine A to the inner nuclear membrane. So there are two groups of drugs that are important here. First group does not allow the formation of this farnesyl anchor. And the second group does not prevent the formation of farnesyl group. They are normally formed but once after they are formed these drugs remove this farnesyl group. So first group of drug is known as farnesyl transferase inhibitor. An important member of this group is lonafarnib which has been tried on animals and by preventing formation of farnesyl group these drugs prevent accumulation of farnesylated prelamine A. The second group is rapamycin which can trigger autophagy and removes farnesylated proserine. With that I would like to conclude this video here. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If that is the case do not forget to give this video a thumbs up. Also you can subscribe to my channel. We upload videos every week on various topics of biochemistry. With that thank you for watching.